This is it. This is the big one. In one corner, you've got Patek Philippe, king of the watchmaking trifecta, and in the other, you've got our Langenzahner, the crisp clinical perfectionist. It's Switzerland versus Germany, classic watchmaking versus polished efficiency, and what better way to fight this fight than with some flagship watches from each brand. This is going to be good. Where to begin with two watchmakers that have as much that is different about them as they do the same? Both practice what is arguably the highest level of watchmaking, both excel in making complications, yet also hold strong ground with their simple classics, and both command loyal, diehard supporters. Even these two watches, on paper, have very little to separate them. Both are 41mm, both are fashioned from white gold, both display perpetual calendars with chronographs, and both source power from incredible hand-wound movements. Even in the details, they match each other incredibly closely. Both have offset subdials, moon phases at 6 o'clock, chunky crowns and squared off pushers, yet sit them side by side and they couldn't look more different without one of them being an MBNF. In the Patek Philippe, a 5270G, you get a strong sense of the French influences from sort of Patek Philippe founder and Frenchman Adrien Philippe. I say sort of founder because the company was already established as Patek, Sapek and C before Philippe came on board, with the Sapek part of the original Polish pair leaving the business in 1844. So, while the company, in one form or another, started making watches in 1839, it wasn't until 1845, the same year our Lange and Zona was founded, that Patek Philippe started trading under the name we all know today. You follow? Anyway, turning our attention to our Lange and Zona's datagraph perpetual, and we immediately see strong Germanic angles, clean, unfussy lines, heavy Gothic lettering. Everything is neat and tidy, from the open, spacious dial right down to the use of a singular font. I expect that if someone otherwise unaware of this brand were asked to guess where it hailed from, they'd get to Germany pretty sharpish. In this inverted colour combination of white text on a grey dial, it makes for a very sombre looking thing. When it comes to appearances, these two could trade blows all day long. It's down to personal taste whether you like the Patek Philippe's mishmash of elements versus our Lange and Zona's carefully orchestrated display, the flared lugs and characterful concave bezel over the straight-laced minimal approach. But what about how these two £100,000 plus behemoths perform? Both companies entertain a similar approach to making their perpetual calendar chronographs, with a manual wind movement decked with a chronograph on the back and a perpetual calendar on the front, but that's where the similarities end. For Patek Philippe, tradition is the name of the game, and so it's predominantly with wheels that the 5270G displays its information. Dial off, it makes for a crowded space, but it means the day and month get prominence at 12 o'clock on the dial, with the date readout relegated to the subdial at 6. Our Langenzona has gone down a different route, choosing not only to prioritise the date as the primary display, but to really prioritise it, fashioning it in the outsized form found on other Our Langenzona watches. I suppose when you think about it, of all the pieces of info a watch like this offers, after the time it's the date that's most likely to be required. Can't be too many people who know the date, but not the month. With such an enormous piece of dial real estate taken up with the big date and its even bigger wheels, the Datagraph Perpetual doesn't have the luxury of smattering other wheels all about the place like the Patek Philippe does. The solution is in the subdials. 
where the 5270G has a pair straddling the centre that serve just one function only. Our Lange and Zona has clawed back some space by overlapping no less than three complications on each, hoovering up the standalone day, night and leap year indicators on the Patek Philippe and layering them with the running seconds and day and chronograph minutes and month respectively. The result is the reverse of what would be expected. The Patek Philippe looks busy, complex and fit to bursting with complications. The Arlangenzona is left with lots of clear space, thanks mainly to needing one less subdial than its rivals, and feels simpler than the Patek Philippe despite the chronograph having an additional flyback complication. And the setup of the two watches takes a similar approach, with Patek Philippe relying on hidden pushers to get the job done. The Arlungenzona does too, but with a little extra thought it's been determined that, once everything is fully set and the watch is left unwound for a few days, quick access to the date adjustment is all that's needed. And so that's what you get, a chunky pusher at 10 o'clock that activates only when the crown is in time setting mode. We're at the final round, and it's here that each brand digs deep to fight for glory, exposes its delicate underbelly to take a devastating swing at the other. For Patek Philippe, that's with the calibre CH29535PSQ. For our Lung and Zona, the calibre L952.1. And what has been said of the rest of these watches can be said about the movements. Despite having similar horizontal clutches and instant minute change features for the chronographs, they are rather different. While the Patek Philippe carries a suitably traditional appeal, it's here that the Arlungenzona shows us that it has a fun side after all. The dial of the datagraph perpetual may be restrained, but the movement is anything but. Layers upon layers of stark, spindly components nesting on top of one another in such close proximity that it's hard to believe it actually works. And if it appears that the L952.1 has more parts than Patek Philippe's equivalent, that's because it does. An extra 100 to be precise, 556 versus 456. This leads to an almost overwhelming spider's web display of watchmaking that does, unfortunately, have a couple of downsides. The Arlung and Zona is just under a millimetre thicker than the Patek Philippe and packs in one and a half times less power reserve. In a world with smartphones, self-driving cars and fridges that can tweet, it's frankly astonishing that we get to see two such different approaches to making these impressive watches. On one hand we have the traditional, the elegant, the slender, and on the other the efficient, the crisp, the analytical. The Patek Philippe has its emotive flourishes, the Arlungenzona its cool logic, and to be honest, if the decision was one made solely with the head, the choice would be easy. But it isn't, so it's not. Which of these two titans do you prefer and why? Let us know in the comments below. Discover more exceptional watches at watchfinder.co.uk If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. If there are any other watches you'd like to see reviewed, please let us know in the comments below.